Hello, I'm Ryan F9, and these are the best helmets ever to be graced with a Snell sticker. So, for Snell helmets under $200, we have the Scorpion EXO R410 versus the HAC CL17. Please excuse the ridiculous graphic. It's what they gave me. Both of these helmets are polycarb, but the HAC is lighter. My neck could have told you that, as it's down a full 100 grams versus the Scorpion. And both of these helmets have pretentious venting systems. HAC calls theirs ACS for Advanced Channel System, and there's absolutely nothing advanced about it except for the brow vent, which we sort of don't see that often. Scorpion, on the other hand, comically overpromises. They say it has six intakes and 10 exhausts, which is a bit like claiming to have a 16 inch penis. In reality, there's only one, two, three, four, five of them. So far as I can tell, Scorpion was referring to the 16 holes on the inside of the EPS liner. Either that or they just can't count. For visors, I give the edge to Scorpion. They use something called a lip tech, meaning that the hinge is on a spring-loaded pivot point so that on the last movement, it sucks backwards and tight with the rubber gasket. Also, I do have a visor lock that doubles as a lever to crack the face shield and clear fog. The CL17 has a visor lock as well, but it does not double as a fog clearing lever. I suppose HAC did supply a pin lock visor to deal with humidity, but on the whole, no. And this is a crappier visor. It doesn't seal as tight, it has less detents, and it feels cheap. Padding goes Scorpion's way as well. It's softer, it's cooler, and it has emergency quick releases. Meanwhile, the CL17's padding is exceptionally forgettable. The R410 is also quieter than the CL17, and an atom bomb is also quieter than the CL17. However, HAC did produce the more aggressive helmet. It has a racer's neckline drawn upwards to pose less risk of breaking your clavicle, to make it easier to go into a full tuck, to check on Johnny Track Day behind you, to shave weight. In general, the CL17 is a faster helmet. Fitment-wise, the Scorpion is a neutral head shape with nothing to report, but the CL17 tends to the rounder side of neutral. Also, that helmet is only DOT rated in sizes 3XL to 5XL, which is something to keep in mind if you have an enormous head. Recall that Snell began to favor smaller helmets after the 2005 scandal, and you have your case in point. Next matchup, Scorpion EXO R710 versus Bell Vortex. Our weight class is Snell helmets under $300. The 710 is one of the cheapest ways to get a fiberglass bucket, and it's not even cheap fiberglass. I mean, Scorpion blended some aramids in here for a better strength to weight ratio. By comparison, the polycarbonate Vortex is a chubby 1,770 grams, over 100 more than the R710. For ventilation, I'm calling a draw. The R710 is special because these forehead tabs are spring-loaded. You need only graze them with a glove, and they'll flick open or closed. On the flip side, these vortex vents are harder to find with gloves on, but they do flow more air, partially because the exhaust ports look like they came off an Airbus, and partially because the vortex takes its DNA from the legendarily breezy Bell Star. Round three. Face shields. The Scorpion seals with its usual lethal force, plus it locks shut and cracks open. Meanwhile, the Vortex has two weak detents and moves with all the fluidity of nails on chalkboard. And I haven't seen a face shield this bad since 1999. In fact, Bell tries to cover up by claiming to be the reigning world champ in shield ease of use. I wasn't aware there was a world championship for visor quick releases, but yeah, that was pretty easy. In the battle of cheek pads, the Vortex can match the R710 for comfort, but alas, Scorpion still has a secret weapon in their emergency quick releases. Noisiness. Well, the R710 is louder than the cheaper R410, maybe because of its wind sail vent cowls, maybe because of the mesh buffeting zones behind each ear. But either way, it's still quieter than the Vortex. At this point, I'd tally the results and tell you to buy the Scorpion, but there's a fitment issue. The R710 has a couple throw pillows for cheek pads, meaning it presses really tight on the lower portion of my face, and is actually too loose on the upper crown of my head. So the R710 is perfect if you have an inverted teardrop for a noggin, otherwise you'll be happier in the neutral shaped vortex. Of course, that is a disappointing helmet in general, and I actually prefer the cheaper R410 and CL17 we saw earlier. Now when it comes to expensive Snell helmets, we have a Mexican standoff. The Shoei RF1200 comes to battle with a $600 price tag and a veteran's experience. And this has been the go-to racing helmet for ages. Only recently, it's been challenged by the HAC RF11 Pro, which inexplicably forgot to earn a Snell sticker. So here we are again. 
The RF-1200 is special because it's quiet. Now Shoei tightened the visor shutter and threw in more soundproofing over the years, which is something that Super Sport helmets rarely bother with. They also molded a rigid rib into the shield to prevent it from warping in the wind. That and they piped the rubber gasket here independently on the top and on the side so that pressure on one won't deform the other. All that to say, the RF-1200 locks out wind noise and rain better than anything else on my list. It's also the lightest helmet here, 1,575 grams for this fiberglass and organic fiber bucket. Plus, it has emergency quick-release cheek pads and a racer's neckline just like the CL-17 we saw earlier. This is pretty close to the perfect helmet in my opinion, only the ventilation is subpar, especially when I'm riding slowly. Next shooter is the Bell Race Star, middle child of the Star family and easily the most bang for your buck out of its sibling. <laughs> Highlights include a massive viewport, big enough to shame everything in this video, both horizontally and vertically. Also, we have the most technical EPS liner with three free-floating layers of different densities for reactive impact absorption. Then the liner is made with real jade minerals, which brings in some good luck feng shui, as well as a natural cooling effect. Plus the emergency cheek pads and the chin strap release with rare magnets. So when you conk yourself out at the track, the paramedics will be impressed with how much you spent on this helmet. Speaking of which, Bell throws in a duffel bag with your $850 purchase. Nice. Weirdest thing about the Race Star is that it is freaking massive. A my size large is 1800 grams and longer than an aircraft carrier, which is very unusual for a carbon fiber helmet. Oh well, at least it's as pretty as it is big. I should mention that this helmet has a neutral head shape with a racer's tightness around the face. It is the best ventilated bucket on my list, and it's quieter than the stars used to be, although the visor still whistles in any position that isn't totally shut. And finally, the Arai Corsair X. If spending $1,000 on a helmet is a good idea, debatable, then this is the best way to do it. Ventilation is clever, and these visor vents are actually channels, moving air to cool the blood flow at your temples. Also, it's aerodynamically adaptable for a half or a full tuck riding position with this adjustable wing. Then safety is streamlined. The cowls all designed to snap off, the side pods sunk flush with the shell, the visor hinge sliding downwards as it turns, allowing the mechanism to sit lower so more of the upper shell is perfectly round, which is both stronger and less likely to throw torque at my neck. In the end, our Corsair X is the best engineered helmet, but who cares? All I can think about from the inside is how bloody brilliant it feels. You might think I'm wearing a cramped 1600 gram bucket, but in reality, I'm inside an aristocrat's veranda. It feels spacious, it feels luxurious. With every nerve on my face, I can tell I'm in something special. And that's it for the best snow helmets. Thanks for watching.